the main hall, they could sit on um, my left side, if I could ask the brothers to um, sit on the right. Apologize for that, guys. Appreciate that. If there are any sisters that would like to come in the main hall, uh, you could definitely do so. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى bless you all it's been a long time we've been haven't had a really a lot of these frequent programs here in the masjid every Friday night because obviously of the COVID situation so it's good to الحمد لله see individuals in the masjid even though we still have our mask on الحمد لله we're not doing the six feet anymore um, so alhamdulillah, it's good to see the masjid full in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also no better to have a program to talk about how to bring people into the, this beautiful deen of Islam and how to do da'wah and how to connect people to this beautiful religion through dialogue, through answering their questions, etc. And no one better to have explain this to us is our special guest speaker to, um, for tonight, Dr. Sabil Ahmed, who's coming all the way from Chicago, alhamdulillah, um, who will be here with us tonight. And he's the director, executive director of a Dawah project called Gain Peace, which is a project under ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America. Even though YS Slam is up there, it's, one, it's another Dawah project. Alhamdulillah, he helps out with that also. Um, but this is one, is, he's a main director of the Gain Peace project. And they do a lot of Dawah conversations, a lot of Islam 101 presentations he has done uh, with other religions, Christians, Jews, etc. Uh, they do beautiful billboards on freeways, um, calling people to Islam. They have a toll-free number that uh, you know people take shahada on all the time, subhanAllah. So it's a very beautiful effort. And he's been doing this for many, many years. So it's probably not a hard question that he's ever got where he wasn't able to answer or he had to research it, etc. So alhamdulillah, he has a lot of experience that we could benefit from tonight. So I don't want to take up any more time. We have Dr. Ahmed Sabil, inshallah ta'ala, to bless us with your knowledge. Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sabi ajmain amma baat. Wa naudu billahi mina shaitani rajim, Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Rabbish rahli sadri, wa yasili amri, wa hlul ugdatam milisani yafkahu khawli. Welcome, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. When Sheikh Shahid is saying that, uh, you know, for many, many, many years, it makes me feel very, very, very old. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, right? Uh, may Allah keep all of us going in Iman with activism, united as Muslim Ummah, conveying the message, connecting humanity with the Creator. Ameen. About two years ago, when I prayed my Asr prayer at MCC, very close to the Skokie in Chicago, uh, as I was walking out of the parking lot to my car, 
I found these two people, these two youth, non-Muslims, uh, Korean looking, and they were distributing some flyers. And I became really curious, what are they distributing, right? Usually people don't do that. So I went to them with a smile. I took the flyer and I found out that this was Christian literature. With a smile, I shook hands with them and I told them, why don't you guys come inside the mosque, inside the masjid? And they did. And I had a chat with them. They were about maybe 18, 19 years of age, right? Teenagers. And I asked them the question, you know, welcome to the masjid, welcome to the area. Uh, where are you guys from? They said, we are from North Korea, South Korea. And they said that there is a convention, there's a Christian convention going on in Chicago. So they came there all the way from North, uh, South Korea to take part in it and do their dawah. And they mentioned all of this in broken English. And I was thinking, you know, look at their faith. Trinity does not make sense. It's a mystery, right? Three persons in Godhead, all of them are God, but not one God. I mean, not three gods, one God. Despite all of the hurdles in their theology, the changing of the Bible, their concept of the Akhira, their concept of who Isa alayhi salam, despite all of that, look at the passion with which they are coming from faraway places to convey their message with us. So what can we do as Muslims? You know, alhamdulillah, it's not just a passion we have, it's an obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And what is that obligation? As I mentioned in my Juma Khutbah, Surah Bakhra, ayah number 143, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a mission. He has given us some, some important direction, some, some destination that we all should be going towards. And that mission that he gave is to connect humanity with the Creator. And he said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُحَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا right? And the ayah continues. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the translation is, that we have made you an ummah justly balanced, that you become witnesses to humanity. The way the messenger of Allah was a witness over you. So no matter what we are doing in our professional life, no matter how small or big the families are, no matter how many massages that we are building, Islamic schools that we are building, our primary responsibility as Muslims is besides the, uh, besides the obligations that Allah has given us, is to connect humanity with the Creator. That is the primary responsibility that every prophet, every messenger, from Adam alayhi salam to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They all came to convey the message of Islam. And we know that there is no new prophet to come, there is no new messenger to come. So that responsibility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with that responsibility. You know, indeed I say it's a blessing because that obligation was never given to any of the Muslims of the time of any of the previous prophets. But that obligation, that blessing, and then we fulfill the blessing, that reward is given to the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if we take it as an honor, inshallah, it will create more passion, increase our passion. Hopefully more of us, inshallah, can convey the message. So those Korean people who came, I mean, they had broken English and that reminded me of a really important Sahabi. His name was Saad bin Abi Wakhas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Speaking not a single word of Chinese, not knowing the culture of China, not having any people waiting for him there, when he went there in the year 648, he went there with small meager possessions, with a small delegation of Muslims. No one was waiting for him there. He did not go on a plane with the halal food, right? Or traveling in the car with all the rest areas and all the you know, important uh, areas we can rest and we can get the food. He went there with camels and horses and walking. Despite all of those challenges, Alhamdulillah, now we can say, because of his sacrifices, there are no less than 30 to 50 million Chinese up there. Muslims, right? May Allah protect all of them. May Allah remove the oppression from them and from all the Muslims so they can, inshallah, live as Muslims and share the message of Islam. So the, how do we 
convey the message of Islam in a conversational way. Right? This is important because we all have colleagues and neighbors and classmates and professors and teachers and your colleagues, other professors. We all need to know how do we do this? If this is an obligation, how do we do this? So I would say first and foremost, we should know the audience. Really important, we have to know the audience. Suppose if you are selling a product, like suppose if you are selling vacuum cleaners, right? If you are supposed to go door to door, or if you are like a salesperson in a store, if you are selling vacuum cleaners, a good salesperson, when the customer comes in, that person would know by asking the questions, what current cleaner, vacuum cleaner the person has. Based on that knowledge, now this person, the salesperson is going to package the message and show them the salient features of the one that he's selling. How that's the new one is going to you know, fill in the gaps and solve some problems that the old vacuum cleaner is not, is not having. So all of these are really important. So first and foremost, we have to develop our speaking and our skills to connect with other people. So for that reason, I would say it's really important for all of us to take some classes. So I take classes. I take classes by, a, by an organization called Toastmasters. Anyone heard about Toastmasters? Yes? Any one of you part of Toastmasters? Oh, I wish all the hands would go up <laughs> right now. But any which way, doesn't matter city college, doesn't matter some masjid classes about speaking skills or Toastmaster, it's really important we have a message. For us to become the best deliverers of the message, sharers of the message, we need to have good communication skills. So for that reason, I would say it's important for all of us to enhance those skills. It's not just enough for us uh, what to say, it is equally important what we should not say. Do you all agree with that? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Surah 16, ayah number 125. <laughs> and the ayah continues. Invite all to the way of Allah with wisdom and good preaching and converse with them in ways which are best and most gracious. Three years ago, I was in New York forgot the name of the masjid, it was one of the big masajis. So we had a masjid open house. Before that, I had a Juma khutbah. So after the Juma khutbah, as I was walking out after the prayer, I saw this non-Muslim lady, she was walking towards me as if she wants to come and ask questions, right? So I paused up there and then I welcomed her and I asked her, okay, how can I help you? So she said that she was part of the people listening to the khutbah and she said that she liked the khutbah but she has a few questions. I said, my dear sister, how can I help you? What questions do you have? So she had some basic questions about the hijab, about changing the Muslim, you know, name, uh, about uh, if someone has non-Muslim parents. After she got convinced, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided her, right? Before she was about to proclaim the shahada, there were many people watching the conversation between me and her. She was about to recite the shahada, right? So that's where we are right now. Then a Muslim brother with good intentions, he interrupted us and he mentioned, you know, my sister, before you take the shahada, before you convert to Islam, do remember that after you convert to Islam, you cannot go back because if you go back, this will happen to you, right? I was like, brother, what is going on? Man, I was shocked. She took shahada, by the way. Right? Alhamdulillah, she took shahada. So it's really important. We have to have good communication skills. Not only what we should say, how to package the message, but what not to say. Knowledge has its value, right? We should have knowledge. Knowledge has its value. However, how do we package the knowledge is equally important. I say it's even more important. You know, when I was part of the Toastmasters, uh, the very first few weeks, I was told to also speak because we all have to speak. That's the reason we are there, right? Not just to listen. So my turn came to speak. I gave my very first speech. The topic of my speech was Islam a blessings for humanity. That was my speech, <laughs> the very first one. Then after my presentation, then, a, then an evaluator came. 
And I was thinking, you know what? He's going to praise the speech. He said, Sabil, you did a good job. But he was really brutal in the evaluation. He said, Sabil, you made 44 errors in your speech. <laughs> really? What errors? So he said, Sabil, all the words that you were using, the ums and the ahs and the you know and the you likes, you're not supposed to do that in a good speech. I totally agree with him. So bottom line is, the very first thing for us to convey the message is that we should become better salespeople or share people of the message. And we know for them, from the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to speak little but profound impact on his speech. He used to be a good listener. He did not used to interrupt the people. He, he used logic and rational. And the most important thing is of all of them, he used to give analogies. You know, when that person came, that young person who wanted to do zina and whatnot, right? The hadith that we know, he asked the person, would you like it if somebody does it for your mother, your sister, your other relatives? He said, no, no, no. Analogies, right? Examples, really important. So in my dawa technique, Yasser, as you may know, right? We work together. About 20 to 30% of conveying the message and making them understand is to give analogies. Is to give analogies, an example. And one brief, uh, again, episode that happened. So it was close to midnight. I was still awake doing some things. And then we received a call on the Gain Pieces hotline. So we have a national hotline, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Anytime, anywhere, 24-7, anyone can call, any non-Muslim. So this lady, she called, and the very first thing she said was, uh, I'm a federal prosecutor. I have a few questions for you, right? I was thinking, come, okay, fine, welcome. What questions do you have? It was a lady. The, the reason she was calling, so I asked her the question, my dear sister, uh, where did you get our telephone number? So she said she saw this billboard in Dallas that spoke about hijab, a strength and freedom, empowerment for the Muslims. She said that she's really angry at the billboard and that she was calling at that time mentioning her background. So this was her question, right? Her question was this, you know, how come you guys are oppressing your ladies when uh, the men can wear anything and your ladies have to cover themselves? <laughs> have any one of you been asked that question? Yes, since you are speak a lot, mashallah, right? In your presentations, yes. So I mentioned to her, since you are a federal prosecutor, so I gave her an answer, then I gave this analogy, this example or this uh, fact from the USA. I mentioned to her, out of the 50 states, there are nine states in the USA in which a man can go shirtless, no consequences. A lady, if she do that, she would be arrested. That's the law. So then I asked her, is that injustice? Are you going to say that the US constitution or the state constitution of those nine states, is it oppressive? No answer, right? So she was getting the point. So I mentioned, mentioned to her that chastity and morality and decency, these are important virtues, not just in Islam, but in all the faiths. Then I gave her examples about Christianity in which in the New Testament, in the first book of Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number five and six, Christian ladies, they're also supposed to wear the hijab. Yes, any one of you knew that? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So it's really important. Many Christians, they don't know that. Some of them, they do. So what happened was, in our main masjid in Chicago, the MCC masjid, one time we, we received a call. And the call came from the Amish people, right? Anyone know Amish, right? They don't use technology and that, like, really, they live pre, like, 1800 times in, in that way. So we received a call. And the person on the other line, he said that we want to come and visit your mosque. We want to see your Friday services and how you pray. And we want to just sit down with you. We said, welcome. Yes, alhamdulillah. So we were excited. So on the day of Friday, myself and the other people, we were waiting outside. We were thinking, you know, all of this horse, chair, you know, uh, uh, all of this, uh, you know, yeah, they would come in, right? We were just waiting for that. But lo and behold, 
yellow school buses came in. <laughs> but what, what I noticed in there was every single lady, she was wearing the hijab. So after the presentation, af after they saw the Friday prayers and listened to the Jummah khutbahs, uh, then I asked them the question as the audience were sitting, that my dear sisters, you are all covering yourselves. What is the reason for it? They said the Bible tells us to. As simple as that, right? So I mentioned to that federal prosecutor that yes, even every religion, every city, every constitution, they have some laws of decency. And these laws are not equal for males and females, really important. You know, in high school, by the way, there are different laws for the female students compared to the male students, so our Allah knows us better. She got convinced, she did not get converted, only Allah can guide her. The bottom line is, in our conversations, important to share the concepts, give analogies, examples, know the data, know the statistics. These are really important along with the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second important uh, tip that I can provide when it comes to conversational da'wah, it's really important for each single one of us that we should know the faith background of the people. We should know the faith background of the people. In the year 627, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa uh, he received a delegation of about 16 Christians. The pastors, they were signed by the, by the king of Najran, and they came and they spent three days and three nights in the masjid of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He did not wait at them, you know, sitting outside in some area. They ate there, he served the food there, they prayed in there, and then they had many, many questions. One of the questions that they asked was this. That, O oh Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa what is the concept of God that you are preaching? At that point, the Prophet remained silent, sallallahu alayhi wa and then the wahi came, and that wahi became Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah 112. Right? A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahi rahmani rahim قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Important here, right? The point I'm trying to make is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is packaging the message of Tawheed, catering to the audience who were asking that question. Really important. See, the people, the Christians who came, they believe in a triune concept of God. They believe that Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, along with the Holy Spirit, they also have the attributes of the Creator. They also believe that uh, Isa alayhi salam, he was, uh, he's the son of God, and God begotten a child. They believe in all of this, Nawaz Billah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is packaging the message of Tawheed uh, so the people can understand. To negate their beliefs and introduce the pure, pristine, uh, you know, Tawheed of Islam, what Islam is teaching. Say he is Allah one and only. They believe in Trinity, Allah is negating that and he's saying he's only one. Not one, not, I mean not two, not three, not multiple persons, only one. He is eternal, he's needed by all. You know, they say that Jesus, peace be upon him, is also eternal. Allah is negating that, saying only Allah is eternal, needed by all, independent. He begets not nor his begotten, negating what they believe and he's needed by all. So it's important for us that we need to know their belief system. I'm not saying that every single one of us should uh, become like Sheikh Ahmad Didat Rahimullah or Dr. Zakir Naik or other such scholars who are really scholars in comparative faith. But all of us, we should have some working knowledge of the people around us. May that be the Hindus who are many IT professionals, maybe the physicians who may be, uh, you know, from Christianity and Judaism especially. Uh, even atheists, we need to know their background. Really important. Even the atheists, by the way. So knowing the background, now we can introduce the concepts. For example, I would introduce to a Christian in a nice way, mentioning to the salient facts, the salient features of the Quran, mentioning to that person that Quran, we only have one version. The same version in Arabic that is being read, benefited by all the Muslims around the world. Same one version from the very first time up until now, it will continue, inshallah. 
we can also mention to them, knowing their background, that what is the concept of the hereafter. They believe in a crucifixion. We believe in self-accountability and the mercy forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So knowing the background is really important. But let me ask you this quiz question to all of you, right? Suppose if you get a knock on your door Saturday morning and then you open the door and two well-dressed people are standing in the front and they have a magazine called the Awake magazine with them. Who do you think these people are? Loudly. Jehovah's Witnesses, yes, yes. Suppose if we don't know that, right? Majority of the Muslims, they may not know that the Awake magazine is by Jehovah's Witnesses. They may not know that what do they believe in. Suppose if we have a conversation with them, like say 45 minute conversation, we keep on saying to them from the Quran, from the Bible, from the logic, from the history, that we, that we don't believe in Trinity. Jesus cannot be God. You know, Jesus is only a prophet. He does not have divine qualities. Look at his description in the Bible. Suppose if you spend 45 minutes, for example, right? Maybe after 45 minutes, they may smile at us and they may say, you know, Sabil, we don't believe in that anyway, right? We wasted 45 minutes. Because they agree with us that Jesus is not God and they agree with us that there is no Trinity. But they still believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, to be as a son of God. And they still believe in Bible, the altered version of the Bible. So important point is for us to package the message in our conversation, we have to know the faith system of the other people. You know, back in the days, back in the days, the scholars, they used to travel for many, many hours, days, months, right? For to collect one data, one hadith, and then used to collect it, they used to compile it. It took them many, many years to compile them, and I would say that Allah has made us so easy nowadays. Because if anyone is saying or asking, how do we gain knowledge about other faiths? I say this is the most uh, resourceful generation in the history of humanity. Is that not so? In our fingertips, right? In your telephones and iPhones and Android and laptop, anywhere you can Google anything, you can get the knowledge. YouTube, hundreds and millions of videos out there. Almost every city, every masjid has some good, you know, qualified people. Sit down with them. So that's the second important point that we should uh, be aware of the people of other faiths. The third important concept that I want to share with you is some people may be hesitant. Maybe you, maybe someone else. You know, Sabil, how do we break the ice and start a conversation? Because I would say if there are three hurdles for Dawa, this is one of them. One, one hurdle can be people may not know that this is an obligation. Secondly, some people may not know and for that reason they are not conveying the message because they may be thinking if they ask us tough questions, how do we respond to them? But the third hurdle people may have is how do we break the ice? We want to convey the message. We can answer the questions, but how do we break the ice? So I have this formula, right? Inshallah. It is really easy. A, B, C, D, right? A, B, C, D. A stands for attract. Attract means you do something, you say something, or you, you know, you create certain environment in which a person automatically is inclined towards asking questions. An example, flying from Chicago to Houston, I was in the window seat and this person was in the middle seat and then the flight was about maybe two hours and then he went to sleep. And I was thinking to myself, how can I convey the message if the person is sleeping, right? Come on, it would be rude for me to wake him up and say, you know what, I'm here to share Islam with you. If I tell that in the plane, I would be news, you know, Breaking news, <laughs> evening news, <laughs> correct? So what I did was, obviously I prayed to Allah all the time, especially in the place for me to convey the message. So as he was sleeping, the flight attendant, she came with the orange juice or juices and the, you know, the, the coffees, and also she was passing out snacks. 
I took one for myself and I requested her, can you please give one because he's sleeping, I will give it to him. She obliged. I took the snack for him. Once he woke up, then with a smile I mentioned to him, you know, you were sleeping, you know, sweet dreams. Here is a snack that you missed out, this is for you. He was so overjoyed, right? Come on, a snack, I mean, come on, right? It looks like a candy for a kid. So he got overjoyed and then that broke the ice. So what I'm saying is, A is for attract. So then the rest of the time, by the way, right, you may be thinking what happened. Alhamdulillah, ice was broken and the conversation got started and I steered the conversation towards Islam. So A is for attract. Some other time what I do is, I carry books with me in the plane or a book with me in the plane. And I most of the time I keep the book facing the cover up so the person will notice the book and start a conversation with me. Alhamdulillah, it happened one time. I mean many times but one story comes to my mind is, the book was the, the case for the creator, right? The case for the creator. I, I left the book up there and just like maybe five minutes into the plane ride, the person, uh, he looked at me and he asked me the question, oh wow, I am reading a book by the same author. How is that book, he asked me. I said, so far I read half of the book, it's awesome. Conver conversation got started, right? A is for attract. Maybe at some other times, you can say at your schools and colleges and work with your colleagues, when the time for prayer comes in, you can say, you know what? Let me take 10 minute break. I need to pray one of my five prayers. If you sneeze, say, Alhamdulillah, right? So small things like that. You can still break the ice and start a conversation. So A is for attract. B is for building the bridges. So once the conversation gets started, you don't speak to them about Islam right away, right? Because sometimes they may be thinking, why is he imposing Islam on me? You don't speak about Islam yet. You still have to build a rapport, more rapport. So B is for building bridges. You just speak about the common things, right? You speak about, suppose if the flight, you're on the plane, you speak about, you know what? How long is the flight going to be? You speak about, okay, you know, what do you do? Where are you headed to? But when you're asking these questions, one of the most important advice that I can give is, the tone of the voice have to be soft. It has to be soft, it has to be something that it is not, that it is going to be receptive to the people. It, it builds the bridges with the person. Because if it's harsh or serious, hey, where are you going, right? It has to be, oh, so where are you going? Something like that, so building the bridges with them. Speaking about the common things, the common aspirations, you know. Uh, so that's for B. C stands for now once the ice is broken, once the bridges are built, the rapport has been built, now we can speak about the commonalities. The commonality especially about faith. Commonalities about purpose of life, right? Commonalities about you know, how, we can, uh, how we can better the world. So it's important for us to know some commonalities between Islam and atheism, for example. Commonalities between Islam and Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism any person, we can still pick out some commonalities. Once that is done, then we can go to D. D stands for now dawa. Now you can deliver the message, right? So again, going from, I think, Chicago to New York. Once the ice was broken, the B was also done. Now the time for C came. So there were two ladies sitting next to me. And I found out because I was already building the rapport with them, A, B, C, that they are from the Catholic background. I want to continue the conversation, engage with them, so I asked them this question. Okay, so you guys read the Bible, so let me ask this question to you, I asked them. Who do you think is the only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran? Wow, she, one of them, she raised the hand with a big smile and she said, oh, I know it, it's Mary, right? I said, wow, so I was clapping for her, right? We have to appreciate what they are doing. Then I asked her the question, how many times? She didn't have the answer, right? So okay, how many times, by the way, any one of you? No? 
Nobody Googles now, right? Yeah, sir, what are you doing? Don't Google. <laughs> 34 times, right? Then I asked her the question, okay, how many times she's mentioned in your Bible? They didn't have the answer. I mentioned 18 times. Since the rapport was already built, I, with a humor, I, I, I mentioned to them, so we love her more than you guys do, right? They cracked up when I said it. Again, the trust, the rapport, the connection, the bridge building. Once you reach that spot, now anything you can say and do, alhamdulillah, they would be receptive in the context of dawah. So for many people like that, what I do is, I carry some brochures with me, I carry uh, one minute cards with me, and I think there are some in the back. We have a dawah booth, why Islam dawah booth up there? Take those brochures and carry them, start conversations, and obviously give it to your colleagues and friends and neighbors or any non-Muslim. The last important thing I want to share with you is, is the fact that, uh, you know, there are, there are so many important ways that we can engage in the conversation, but how do you keep the conversation going? First and foremost, it's important we cannot overwhelm the person. I get excited if someone asks me anything about Islam, I will get excited, you may get excited, but in that excitement, we have to always remember the human psychology, which is we should not overwhelm the person. If you overwhelm the person, the person will not listen or they may not engage with you right further. And I learned a lesson the hard way. So in my school days, I used to uh, assemble Motorola telephones, right, way back. I used to assemble it, I liked the job, you know, school days, you know, good money for a student. Uh, so next to me was a Christian person. And I started the conversation and he started to engage with me. He became interested. So what I did was, I went home, I went to the internet, I printed out literally this thick number of papers. I was excited. Man, this person is going to convert to Islam tomorrow, right? I had that mentality. I went the next day. I gave him the papers, right? This thick, literally. And then he took home. He thanked me. The next day I came back. I said, you know, Charles, have you read what I gave you? And Charles said, uh, no, Sabil, not yet. A week later, not yet. A month later, not yet. Then I realized I was overwhelming Charles. So a technique that I'm going to advise myself and all of you is give little, make them curious, let them ask questions. Once they ask questions, it's a fair game. So what are some of the ways you can make them curious? So one would be you can ask them, okay, you know what, who do you think is the the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, and that prophet is the most mentioned prophet by name in the whole Quran. Making them curious, right? Okay, who do you think, sisters? Prophet? Louder, louder. I cannot even hear you. Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, right? Okay, alhamdulillah, right? People would be, so now you're doing the commonalities. Especially with the Jewish people, I use this, right? But even with the Christians. Then I say to them, 134, 36 times, he's mentioned in the Quran. His message, his miracles, his people, his challenges, how he overcame them. Then I mentioned to them, the second most mentioned prophet in the whole Quran, by name, uh, would be who? Ibrahim, alayhi salam, right? 69 times. Then other prophets, like Isa is mentioned 25 times. Uh, Adam is mentioned 25 times, and other prophets. Then also to incite them uh, to ask questions and to keep, the, to keep the conversation going, I may also mention to them that uh, can you mention any miracle which is mentioned in the Quran, not mentioned in the Bible, right? Some of them, they would know it. So if I ask you the question, what would you say, anyone? Yes, yes, yes. So he spoke when he was a baby, correct? Uh, and other miracles. He used to make birds of clay and they used to fly off. And he kind of told them, you know, what they ate in the morning. So there are certain miracles that are mentioned in the Quran, not mentioned in the Bible. 
But I will mention to them that all of these miracles that Prophet Jesus was doing, according to the Bible itself, according to the Quran also, Surah 3, Ayah number 49, every single one of them, it is by the permission of Allah, not by his own. So we have to go to the source and pray to the source and worship the source and submit to the source and not to the human or the prophet uh, who was doing the miracles. Then I will quote them from the Bible also, by the way. So that's where it comes uh, some working knowledge of the Bible. I would mention to them in the New Testament, in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, chapter number five, verse number 30, Jesus, peace be upon him, he mentioned, I of myself, I cannot do anything. Whatever I hear, I judge. And my judgment is true because I seek not my own will, but the will of God who sent me. So lastly, let me just end with this uh, profound story. Inshallah, it really touched me. Hopefully, it will also touch you. Then we will open the floor for Q&A, right? Inshallah. I went to Louisville for a masjid open house. As we were setting up before the guests came in, the non-Muslims, this brother, he mentioned this story to me. And he said, you know, Dr. Sabir, this is a true story. It happened to one of the brothers of Louisville. This is the story. Saturday morning, somebody knocked at the door about 10 a.m. in the morning, the Muslim brother, he opened the door. He was excited that there were Christians standing there. With full passion, full emotions, right? Full evidence, he started to share Islam with them. And they also were sharing their belief, their ideology, and their Jehovah's Witness uh, background with the Muslim brother. You know, 15 minutes passed, half an hour passed. The brother was really passionate, sharing the message, right? I mean, you would be, I would be. After one whole hour of engagement, the Jehovah's Witness person, they asked him one question, and the Muslim brother, he was not able to respond to it. If I was in the place of the Muslim brother, I would not be able to respond. Neither would you. Neither would you, Yasser. And Yasser may be thinking, really? What? What question it could be, right? Come on, anything we can make up an answer, how can you be silent, right? I would be silent. This was the question. If you are so passionate about your faith and you are sharing with me with so much emotion for one whole hour, how come you're sitting in your home when we are outside sharing our message? You know, day in and day out, rain, water, snow, right? Any weather, they're out Saturday morning. You know, when I was there in Dominica for medical school, it had the whole population of the country was, uh, what, 82,000, like a suburb, right? Like a small suburb. Even then, when I went out Saturday morning for shopping, they were out there with the Awake magazine, waking early, getting dressed, going door to door, sharing their message. If they can do it, with all the disunities and the immoralities and the friction and the infighting within their community, why can't we when Allah has given such a humongous blessings? Not only the blessings, not only the one Quran, not only you know, all the resources, Alhamdulillah, he also gave us the honor and the obligation to share the message. So I hope and pray, following the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, following the example of the noble companions who took the message to different parts of the world, doesn't matter what our neighbors, our colleagues, they may think, as long as we are doing, using hikmah, conveying the message, using the proper you know, intentions, using the proper the methodology, that's what counts no matter what people say, no, no matter what people do. One life to live, and I pray to Allah that may he make it possible so we can give the most, we can give the best, we can learn more about Islam, we can learn more about other people. As United Muslim Ummah, I pray that all of us, we become ambassadors of Islam and ambassadors of peace. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair. Dr. Sabil, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm uh, part of Why Islam SoCal, and I just wanted to do a couple of quick announcements before we open it up for Q&A. 
And not only Q&A, if anyone has anything they want to share, um, dawa experiences, and so on and so forth, please feel free to do so. It's not limited to only questions. So a couple of quick question, uh, announcements. Um, first of all, Dr. Sabil will be giving a few more con uh, talks this weekend, inshallah. So tomorrow after Fajr in the Corona Masjid, there's going to be a seven habits of successful da'i talk by Dr. Sabil. And then there's a, the main event for tomorrow in Hawthorne, Islamic Center of Hawthorne, between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. It will be an open mosque day. So if you have any non-Muslim friends or people considering Islam, please invite them to that one in particular. And then Sunday we have the da'wah training, inshallah, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Islamic Institute of Torrance. So again, I'm with Why Islam SoCal, and we have some material out there and a sign-up sheet. I would love it for people to s put their name down and help us out, inshallah. And there's a donation box if anyone feels inclined to give some money as well. Um, let's open it up for questions, and if anyone has any da'wah experiences, please feel free to do so. Most what state? Liberal, Liberal okay. So how to deal with them or how to engage with them? Or if they ask the question that, you know, what does Islam say about LGBT? How do we, how do we deal with the topic, right, generally? Okay. It's really important that uh, we have to hold true to the principles of Islam. It's really important. We cannot dilute it. We cannot uh, uh, beat around the bush. We have to mention what the truth is. So the way that I mentioned, like, Suppose tomorrow, if the question comes in, right, we have non-Muslims coming to a masjid. If they ask me the question, I would say to them this, you know, our faith, the faith of Islam, we believe that there is a creator, and that creator is the most wise, he's the most knowledgeable. Any commandments, any guidance, any instructions that he has given to us, there is always a benefit in it. Sometimes we may realize the benefit, sometimes we don't, but if we know that he exists, when we know the Quran is true, we hear and we obey. That's point one. Point number two is, we say that Islam has comprehensive uh, instructions for all walks of life. That includes marriage. So marriage according to the creator, it's uh, only between a male and a female. Point number three would be, there is Islam does not uh, permit uh, intimacy Premarital or extramarital, really important. Even within marriage, there are certain restrictions how to approach. Point number four would be, I would say to that person, Islam did not introduce the prohibition of uh, you know, same gender relationships. Other face of the world, Old Testament, New Testament, you know, other scriptures, they also are on the same page, they also prohibit same gender you know, intimacy. Point number five would be, that does not mean that at a human level we, have to, we can discriminate them, we should not. Suppose if they come for job application, we cannot discriminate them based upon their gender preference. Yes, we can sit down, we can advise, we can console them, uh, you know, give them counseling, but we cannot discriminate for the basic necessities that every human should be going with. Last but not the least, if there are certain people who would like to come to the masjid from that inclination, we should say to them, to the non-Muslims, that we don't have a checklist by the door, by the entrance, that, you know, did you, have you smoken today? You cannot come in. Did you backbite it? Did you sin? Did you, you know, what's your preference, you know, gender preference? No, we don't have a list like that. We welcome any person. However, as brothers, as sisters, we will show them, we will remind them, this is the Quran, this is the guidance. You know, ultimately, no matter what inclinations that we have, uh, we have to know that what does God expect us to do in any circumstances, any interaction, even within family. Because if we are patient with perseverance and following Allah's guidance, even with that inclinations, inshallah, our greater reward ultimately would be up there. 
So these would be the six points I would mention to the people. Yes. Again, no beating around the bush. We have to be straightforward, but mentioning that Islam did not introduce it, same thing I would say to people when they ask the question about polygamy, right? Islam did not introduce polygamy. It was always there, already there in the previous scriptures. Islam came to restrict it, gave the proper responsibility to the husband and proper rights to the wives and a protection for her and a blessing for her, right? So alhamdulillah, good question, alhamdulillah. Sisters, go ahead, anything, you know, from um, your colleagues, your neighbors who may be asking, uh, there are many restrictions at work, maybe we cannot speak about religion or politics, how do we go about, so anything, yes, brother, go ahead. MashaAllah. Yes. As simple as that, you know, as simple as that. Craig's place, right? It's free, advertisements are free there. Okay. Uh -huh. MashaAllah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> and you text them maybe, right? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you know, so there's so many, so the bottom line is there are so many opportunities. How many of you have heard about Meetup? Meetup group, yeah, some of you, right? So right now, Meetup group is like really easy way and a new way of sharing the message. So our team in Chicago, the, we are part of the Meetup many groups by connecting with them and building the rapport with them. Now they're inviting us. Now they're giving us the platform, these non-Muslim admins up there that share Islam. So they have created us many series about Islam. So for the last three weeks, we are giving them uh, topics. Islam 101 was one week ago. Before that, it was women in Islam. Before that, it was Sharia. 15th of December, it is uh, the Muslim Jesus, right? So it, it is so popular, by the way, they only had in that Zoom account, only like 100 people can come in. So 100 people already RSVP'd, and there were 75 more people in the waiting list. So they are creating that for us. So I'm going to really encourage each single one of you to become part of that group. So there are many such opportunities I'm saying, besides the one-to-one -one with your colleagues and neighbors and with your classmates. Go ahead, any other question, comment? Yes, brother. Yes.
okay, okay. So this is, it's really common. When we start to share Dao or Islam with them, they will start to share Christianity, for example, right? However, what I would say is, converse with them or engage with them, at least to let them know what Islam is. Let them preach, okay, fine, let them preach. But at least from your side, share with them what Islam is. At least on the day of judgment, they cannot complain that no one told them about Islam. But what does it mean that share Islam, right? What does it mean? I would say at least you have to convey four concepts within Islam. That's when I would say I have shared Islam with them. The very first one, concept of Allah, who Allah is. Second concept in Islam is about uh, messengers and prophets. They're all connected. They all came to share the one message. Uh, they are humans, they're not God, son of God, not divine. So messengership, right? So that's concept number two. That also includes Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, as a messenger. Concept number three would be the concept of guidance, Quran as a guidance for humanity. It has solutions for humanity. Right? It came not only for the Muslims, the Arabs, and the you know, Desis, it came for all of humanity as our guidance. That's number three. Number four would be the concept of the hereafter. As long as we convey the four important items or concepts with them, then I would say to some degree our dawah is done, we should still leave the door open. Not close the door because who knows, sometimes Allah gives hidayah, after many weeks, many months, sometimes many years. In that time, as you're conveying the four concepts, let them preach whatever they want to preach, right? At least you're engaging with them because if you shut them off, you may not get chance to convey the four items. I'll give you one example, inshallah. When I was working in the clinic, there was a Christian lady and I used to share Islam with her, right? Bits and pieces, not overwhelming her. And then I left the clinic, then I moved away to some other place. Two years ago, after I was done with the prayer, I went to the lobby, and then there were some men, women, they were having some part in masjid area, right? Lo and behold, alhamdulillah, she was there, wearing the hijab. And I asked her, Melissa, welcome, what are you doing here? She said, Dr. Sabil, I converted to Islam. And I said, Allahu Akbar, right? I mean, Allah guided her, not me, not she, Allah guided her. So we should let them engage with us as long as we convey these four concepts with them. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Right, right. Alhamdulillah. No, Jazakallah khair for that knowledge, mashallah. Brother, you had a question in the back, then I will come to you, inshallah. Unless the sisters have, let's take uh, the brother in the back, yes. You have to speak up because your mask is like coming in the way. Okay, mashallah. 
Yes, wonderful question. That's a really practical question. So what I would say is, after I'm done with the four concepts, after each concept, I keep on asking them the question, you know, dear brother, do you understand what I said? Does it make sense to you? That, you know, there has to be one creator, and the creator cannot be a human, cannot be a person who is fallible with human qualities, right? So once that concept makes sense, then I go to the next one, the next and the next. Then I will invite them to Islam. That it looks like, you know, John, that you're agreeing with the four concepts. You know, th obviously this makes sense, right? Brother John, a God cannot be a, a man. All the prophets, they did not came to preach a different faith, each one of them. They all were consistent preaching one faith. There has to be some guidance, comprehensive guidance. Humanity needs guidance. Where is that guidance? Uh, there has to be some accountability, just like we have accountability at our work in the schools and colleges. So I will read their faces, their tone, their questions, and then I will invite them by saying this. You know, John, since you agree with all of these things, it is important for you, for your hereafter, for your peace, for your purpose, for your blessings, that start submitting to that one creator that all the prophets came to invite people to. If he says, yes, how do I do it? Then I go over the six beliefs, the five pillars, and help him with the shahada and appoint a mentor. If he says, you know what, just give me some more time. I understand and I do accept these are the truths. I don't leave that person yet, right? I give them some, some not pressure, some kind of encouragement. I would mention to him, life is very uncertain. Anything can happen to anyone. It is important for you and me that we have to start submitting to the creator. And the rest of your life, we can help you and then you can read more, you can practice more, but don't delay this really important step because we want to die as believers, as submitters to the creator. So he can, by his mercy, induct us into paradise. Even after that gentle encouragement, even if he says, you know what, oh, let me read the Quran, please, or something, I would not push more because that would be actually pushing. I would give them some literature, exchange telephone numbers, and maybe a day, a week, a month, I will keep in touch with the brother, right? Keep on praying to Allah and keeping in touch with the brother. So that's the technique I use. So important, important. If I have to have a uh, mathematical equation for dawa, it would be like this. Information plus invitation equals dawa. It's not just information passing the brochures. That's only one part of dawah. In, uh, information plus invitation equals dawah, right? And I'm getting that from that ayah of the Quran. Invite all to the way of Allah with wisdom and good preaching and converse with them in ways which are best and most gracious. So as they say, close the deal. Don't leave them hanging. Because they may be thinking, you know what, it makes sense, but what do I do next? That's when you actively invite the person. Don't be shy, right? We should not be shy. Because on the day of judgment, they may be appealing to Allah that I wanted to, but nobody invited me. But using hikmah, using hikmah. Sometimes after you're done with the concepts, it may take maybe a week, two weeks, a month before you invite them. Suppose our colleagues, for example, right? Our neighbors. But if I'm sitting next to a person on the plane, if I shared with them the concepts, and I know that that may be the last time I'm seeing that person, I would invite him in the plane itself. And alhamdulillah, there have been a few shahadas in the plane. Allah gave them the, you know, the guidance. But yes, in the plane also, with any stranger, if you think that's the only time you're meeting with them. Or else the rest of the people, colleagues and neighbors and classmates, you can extend a bit longer. But don't extend for eternity, right? There has to be some time limit. Yes. Yes. So the question is, in the very first meeting, that person embraced Islam in the plane? Yes, he did. Alhamdulillah. Yes. What is the toughest question that uh, I had to answer when I'm giving dawah? 
Uh, yes, there is one question, which is, it is not tough because there is no answer to it. It is tough because the environment in this country, in the society 21st century is such that people would not understand unless and until they have the proper context and Allah's wisdom and the situation 1400 years ago. And that question is about female slaves. Yes. Obviously there is answer and the hikmah and the reason and the context and the guidance and the boundaries, all of them are there, but people in this country, they may not understand it fully, why that? It's also there in the Old Testament, New Testament too, by the way, but I'm saying that is one of the challenging questions, right? Other question I would say challenging would be the concept of polygamy. People in this country for many, many centuries, uh, they're used to one male and one female. I mean, now things are changing, unfortunately. But traditionally, one male and one female, not two females, not four females, not many, one male and one female in marriage. So for them, it looks really odd. Four wives, one husband, what's going on, right? So then we have to give them the proper context, scriptures, comparative religion, you know, science and logic and sociology and psychology. We have to fill in all of those gaps so they can understand. You know, this is for Dawa, it's really important. Just because they are not happy with what we conveyed to them, even though we tried our best, does not mean that what we said was wrong. So their reaction, we should not judge what we said based upon their reaction. On the flip side of it, just because they're happy with what we said, doesn't mean what we said was right. Because who knows, somebody's saying to please them, right? So it's really important. I went, yeah, sir, I was at UIC a long time ago. Abdul Sattar was there, other people were there, right? So this is a long time ago. So uh, UIC is a campus in Chicago, University of Illinois, Chicago, right? It's not University of Indians and Chinese. <laughs> no, <laughs> people, there are a lot of Indians and Chinese up there. So regardless, there was a interfaith event it, it was an interfaith event. So I was there from the Muslim side. There were many, many Jews, Christians, people of other faith. And then there was a Christian pastor sitting next to me. Now here is the question, right? And this is one of the quote unquote tough question. Not anymore, but some people. What if Christians, so the question was this, what if we Christians coming from the audience, if we don't embrace Islam, what do you think will happen to us? I mean, we know what will happen to them. So I mentioned to them what the Quran says, what the Sunnah says, I did, I, I tried my best. Quoting from the Quran, even quoting from their scriptures that they don't accept, like they would say the same thing. That if no, if a person does not take Jesus to be Lord and Savior, do not take him to be God, Son of God, Divine and Trinity, obviously they will condemn us to hellfire. So I said that this is what Islam says that uh, if a person knows about Islam and consciously rejects Islam uh, and dies like that without coming back, without repenting, then there would be consequences just like there would be consequences if in a classroom, despite the instructions of the professor or the teacher, the person does not come to class, right? The student does not take the assignments or completes the assignments, the quizzes, the exams, participation, there would be consequences. So I said that person, according to Islam, chapter three, verse number 85, and other narrations from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that person would not go to paradise, that person would be in hellfire, but it's not me I mentioned to them. I'm only mentioning the criteria mentioned in the Quran, chapter two, verse number 25. If a person has the right belief in doing good deeds, Allah guarantees paradise for that person. On the other hand, chapter four, verse number 116, it says that if the person is committing shirk, associating partners, that's the only unpardonable shirk, uh, sin in Islam. Anyway, I gave them a comprehensive answer. And then as we were done, I took my hand and I about to shake the hand to the pastor. 
he did not shook hand with me. He took the mic and he said, Dr. Sabir is condemning us to hellfire. <laughs> right? I said, come on. Aren't you condemning me to hellfire if I don't accept? I mean, I, I didn't say that, right? So then there was a big commotion between the people. Then Abdul Sattar and other people, they came up on the stage and they tried to calm people down. And I mentioned this to the, to the MSA. Just because what you mentioned to them, they are not happy, does not mean what you said is wrong, right, I mean, uh, wrong. And just because they are happy with you, doesn't mean what you said was right. What is right, you have to say using hikmah, obviously, right? Because if I would have sugarcoated, diluted, or beat around the bush on that answer, they would hold me responsible on the day of judgment. We asked you a question, what will happen to us? And you said, nothing, we all go to paradise, right? Come on, I cannot say that. So they may hold me up there, better they hold me here than up there. So it's important for us, say how it is, using hikmah, but packaging, packaging it in such a way that evidence, right? Analogies, examples, comparative religion, all of them we have to include in those answers. Alhamdulillah, good question, mashallah. Yes, brother. Okay, so you're saying that maybe for that answer, why didn't I say that this is not the proper time for me to elaborate on the answer? Uh, I could have said that, but then what if that was the only time I'm seeing that person, that student or the, those audience members? Then they would be deprived of the right instructions how to go to paradise and how to avoid the hellfire. So, it's a delicate topic, but we have to say it because their akhara is dependent upon the right answer. You know, akhara is dependent on it, so we cannot, uh, plus it does not look nice if we say to them, you know what, it's not the right time to, for me to respond to it, right? They may say, come on, uh, it looks as if we are trying to dodge the question. We need to answer, we need to know the answer and use the answer with hikmah, but not Responding will not look nice. Yes, I hope you understand, right? Because all of these reasons, yeah. Yes, sister, go ahead. Can you go forward? And ask? Sorry, I'm not able to hear. So. Uh, just saying that, that Allah will decide on the day of judgment, it is, it is not sufficient. Because, uh, because, you know, Allah is very clear that what is the criteria for Allah's mercy to come into play for a person to go to paradise. What we can say is that I cannot or Muslims cannot condemn this person or that person. Ultimately, Allah decides who is going to go to paradise but he has given certain criteria that if a person keeps on doing that, then they will go here. If a person keeps on doing these things, having the right belief and doing good deeds, that by Allah's mercy, they will go to paradise. By saying that, now if you supplement by saying your statement that ultimately Allah will decide based upon the criteria that who is going to go there, but this is a minimal criteria that is given by the creator. Because if we just say that, you know what, Allah is going to decide, that means we are just leaving them like a really vague. Then they may not know if paradise is the ultimate desti destination, there has to be some borders. 
some instruction, some guidance, if nobody knows it, if the Muslim uh, you know, teacher is not giving them the proper answer, then it just leaves something incomplete. So it's important for us to give the criteria, but we can say that personally, for that specific person, nobody knows it. Allah is going to decide on individual basis. Yeah. But that's a good comment, good question, and good concern, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, it's important. Comparative religion and showing that the message of Isa alayhi salam was to invite humanity to the creator, not to worship him, not to take him as divine. You have a question. You had one? Okay, go ahead, yes. Then speak up, please. It's hard to hear. For Muslims, you're saying they do something which is not accepted by Islam. You're saying okay. I'm not sure if I understood the question. Uh, so what you're saying is that if some Christians or some non-Muslims, if they look at the Muslims that, you know, they're doing all their wrong things, maybe... Sure, sure. Right, so the brother is saying that some Muslims who are not doing, you know, we are not perfect, by the way, we all have shortcomings. So when we say some Muslims, I mean all of us. So should we say that to the non-Muslims, that some Muslims, they break the law and what uh, Quran and the Sunnah teaches? Definitely. In my open house tomorrow also, inshallah, in other lectures, what I say to them is, do not judge Islam, which is perfect, by followers who are imperfect. Or a different way I put, them, put that same concept is that I say to my, so I say to the non-Muslims, that I say to my Christian, Muslim brothers and sisters, let's not judge Christianity or the Bible based upon the actions of the Christians who may have done the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the genocide of the Native Americans, right? Uh, then I have a long list of things I, I mentioned to them. So I say to them, if I want to learn what, what Christianity is, I would consult a knowledgeable Christian, maybe go to a pastor, priest, or perhaps look into the Bible. In the same way, if you want to know what, Quran, what Islam is, do not, judge, do not judge Islam based upon the actions of a few misguided people. Look into the Quran, which has perfect guidance, and look into the noble life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And once you do that, you will find that Islam is going to bring peace and purpose for you. It will bring guidance for you and ultimately paradise for you, inshallah. So yes, so we have to have a demarcation between the actions of the Muslims and the perfect teachings of Islam. Yes, sister, go ahead. Yeah. Can you go close by? I cannot hear you, sorry. That's a good question, mashallah, right? I hope tomorrow that question would be coming too. 
uh, huh? yeah, in the open mosque day. So the re yeah. Mashallah. Yes. So again, giving examples, analogies, right, or comparison. So the way that I start, and then I also plug that into, by the way. Way I start is, hijab is a dress code. Anytime, anywhere that we go, there's always a dress code. If you go to work, there is a dress code. If you go on the street, there is a dress code. If you go to uh, any schools and colleges, there is a dress code. Hijab is the dress code our creator has given for humanity. Right? Again, analogy, right? Then I say to them, hijab or the con concept of modesty, it came as a commandment which is mentioned in the Quran. Just to let them know that it's not some Muslim scholars or some other people, they are forcing people. It is a commandment in the Quran. Then I mentioned to them the two places. Surah Nur, ayah number 31, and uh, Surah Hizab, ayah number 59. The third important point I mentioned to them is, hijab, the concept of modesty, is not just only what we wear. It's a comprehensive concept that includes the modesty of the eyes. You know, in Surah number, Surah Nur, ayah 30 says, that say to the believing men, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. It is better for you in the eyes of Allah. So hijab of the eyes, right? Or modesty of the eyes, modesty of the tongue and the ears and the, uh, and the physical interactions between males and females. Then fourth point I would say to them is that the, the amount that we are, sub or what we should be wearing, it is equal to the males and also the females equally. The only difference is the extent is more to the females compared to the males. Then I give them the other, the other uh, instructions in, in, in uh, what we wear, is that both females and males, we cannot wear tight clothes, even for the males. We cannot wear transparent clothes. We cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender. We cannot wear clothes that symbolizes people of other faiths, like crosses and things like that, right? So it's equal, males and females. The next point I mentioned to them is that there is a concept of uh, hijab also in the Old and the New Testament. Also Hindu scriptures too. Then I give them examples from the Old and the New Testament. The sixth important point I mentioned to them is, there is always a concept of decency uh, and modesty and chastity in every culture, every society, every state. So then I go over with them some of the modesty laws in different states. That if a person does that, they would be kicked out of the plane, for example, right? Not wearing properly, or from the school, or from the work, or from any public place, or from the street. So Islam is not unique in concept of clothing and modesty. And the last thing I mentioned to them is that hijab is not uh, a forced, uh, that our sisters are not wearing it because somebody is forcing them. They're wearing it because they want to please the creator. So they want to be seen uh, and not objectified. They want to be seen uh, and, and, and be honored by their personality and by their practicing of Islam and by their contributions and the blessings that, that, our, uh, that, that, that our God has given to them. Lastly, I mentioned to them that hijab, by wearing the hijab, by empowerment and the strength and the freedoms Islam has given to women, Women of the past and currently, they are making humongous impact in the society. Then I give them some, some examples. From Aisha Anha, for example. And in history, how Fatima Al-Fahri, how she became the founder of the oldest continuous university in the whole world, according to UNESCO, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. She founded the oldest continuous university wearing the hijab, uh, which is uh, in Morocco. Established in 859, uh, before Harvard and Oxford and any universities. So she was a fully practicing wearing the hijab. Then you can give current examples, how there are like 15,000 uh, Muslim lady doctors, they wear the hijab. Uh, lawyers, right? Uh, IT professionals, school teachers. So you can give certain and you know, any example that you can think of. And then you can wrap up by saying, that hijab and the concept of modesty, if humanity adopts it, there would be chastity, morality, decency, justice, and the outcome would be peace and equality for all.
So that is the higher benefit of wearing the hijab. Yes, brother and then brother, right? Because I'm just speaking those who have not yet, <laughs> not yet, uh, you know, asked any question. Then I will still be here, inshallah, for us. Yes, brother. Alhamdulillah, yes. Okay, mashallah. What would we, uh, what do you advise the MSAs? for how to do dawah on schools and colleges. You know, first and foremost, it's really important. Even before we do dawah, we have to make sure that we excel. We have the credibility. We should be seen as the best student on the campus. And the reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the distinction and the honor and the blessing uh, in surah number three, ayah number 110. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْحَوْنَا أَنِ الْمُنْكَرْ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And the ayah continues that you have been made the best of ummah for humanity because you enjoin good, you forbid evil, and you believe in Allah. So we have to be the best student, right? I have so many examples, but for, just for the sake of brevity. Then secondly, it's important we have to find out that what are some of the needs of the students, of the student body and MSA should step up to fulfill some of the needs. Suppose if some math tutoring is needed to some freshman, for example, MSA should be the one, right? Or some other subjects. Number three would be, even join with other non-Muslim organizations like the Christian students, Hindu students, to do good work for benefit of humanity, all right? And obviously there are many opportunities in which uh, the MSA students, you can approach professors humanities, and when, when they're teaching about different faiths, uh, sociology, they may all need, they all touch upon topics about Islam or religion. You can volunteer yourself saying that we have Muslim speakers. We can come and present those topics. And last but not the least, uh, try to be part of the school newspaper, right? And the student council, possibilities are unlimited, right? There are so many possibilities, by the way. And obviously as an MSA body, try to be part of uh, the masjid committee's activism because we need to make the youth realize that not only Allah wants to make ourselves better with Allah's guidance, but we have a job to do for the greater society. Good questions, may Allah preserve our youth and help us all to do more for Islam. Yes, last question maybe? <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. I would still be here if anyone would like to, yes, go ahead please. Sure, sure. So the question is, so there are many atheist people all over the world actually, right? Um, according to the 2018 Pew Research Survey, bad news, 23% of the ba born and raised Muslims, they're leaving Islam, 23% of them each single year. May Allah protect all of us. So atheism is growing. So out of the 23%, 55% within that, they're becoming atheists, 26% are becoming Christian and other faiths. So how to do dawah to the atheists? You know, I mean, the whole, I'm giving a 12 week series just on this topic right now, right? <laughs> so maybe a two minute answer, condensing the 12 weeks, two ways to approach it, right? And I will, I will mention this with a story. So we received a call Yasser some time ago, right? On the dawah hotline. And this lady, she said that I am an atheist, I would like to meet you. So she, since she was a lady, I had my wife with me. So we went to the Skokie Public Library and in one of the study rooms, so we met myself, my wife and that lady. We met for two sessions. In the very first session, I mentioned to her that using every branch of science, we can show that there is a higher power that exists. Using biology, biochemistry, using physics, using cosmology, every branch of science leads towards a higher power. I gave her the examples. 
in the next session, so I just left at that, right? Because it was a long session. I, I want her to process that. In the next session, alhamdulillah, she came back a week after, and then her question was this. Okay, fine, I believe that there is a creator, but there are so many faiths out there, so many religions, so many different concepts of God. How can you say that your concept of God that Islam preaches is the right concept of God? I have a standard explanation, and I gave her that answer, alhamdulillah. She converted to Islam right in the library. Allahu Akbar. Not because of me, Allah guided her. But an important lesson for all of us is, we as Muslims, this is the most resourceful society in the history of humanity. So all of us, we should have enough working knowledge. If an atheist approaches us, we should have enough knowledge to even share in a convincing way with that atheist. If a professor agnostic approaches us, we should have enough knowledge how to convince that person with the best way possible. A Christian pastor, a Jewish rabbi, a, a RSS Hindu, right? All of us, we should have that basic fundamental knowledge. You know, when we go to schools and colleges to become a doctor, 12 years of study, for example, IT professional, maybe six years of study, right? Any professional, we invest so much time. Why don't we spend time when our primary responsibility as Muslims is to share the message? Why are we just listening to only the YouTube videos and passing WhatsApp messages, only the Juma khutbas? No, we can read good books, take some good courses. This is our faith. And we have to align with, with the mission Allah has given, which is connected with the akhara that Allah has for us. So I'm going to recommend every single one of you, read every day. Right? Read every day, half an hour, one hour, two hours. You know, Warren Buffet, he reads for six to eight hours every day. Not every month, every day, right? The second, third richest man in the whole world. Reading should be our monopoly. Knowledge should be our monopoly. Now they are the ones who have that. So at the end of the day, Alhamdulillah, Islam has answers to all the questions, guidance to all of humanity, but we are the ones, we are not benefiting from that humongous knowledge. And I hope and pray, alhamdulillah. Oh, okay. Okay, mashallah, right? Uh, obviously, guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to make sure that we have to have the right intentions. As we, you know, for anything that we do in Islam, we have to have the right niyam. Not for showing off, not for YouTube, more likes or Facebook and whatnot. Right niyam is really important. The human concern has to be there for that person. How can I let that person go towards hellfire, right? So that concern has to be there first and foremost with the niyam. Second thing would be, we have to look at the noble example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what methodology that he used to use with a smile, using hikmah, with patience and kindness and concern, how he used to invite people to Islam. Number th third really important is, suppose if a person is like a harsh critic of Islam, we also need to learn from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even for those individuals, how he used to interact with them. Um, you know, not like, coming to the same level of harshness, becoming angry, no. We have to have empathy with them because they may not know better. Maybe that's all that they know. Maybe they are just Fox News watchers. Who knows, there are so many people like that. So maybe the short term, shortcoming is ours. If they are angry at Islam, maybe the shortcoming is ours. We have not done our duty. If there are patients who are dying, maybe the good doctors are not connecting, not giving them the proper medicine. So we have to have the empathy, right? So using all of these, it creates a frame of mind. And that frame of mind would be that now with concern, with kindness, with compassion, with hikmah, now we deal with that person to that level. You know, const constantly doing dua for that person. Even if the person converts to Islam, obviously the proper mentorship has to be there, right? Uh, and the mentor has to be like wise using hikmah, not overwhelming the person. So all of these, so the most important thing is, what would the Prophet do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if he were in our situation? By asking that question, everything else becomes easy because sometimes our culture, 
uh, our emotions, right? Our impatience, our shortcomings come, comes into play. But always asking this question, what would the Prophet do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he were in my shoes with that person who is interacting with me? So may Allah help us to take Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the best role model as the Quran mentions in Surah Ahzab, Ayah number 21, and help us to follow not just some culture, some opinions, but sticking to the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With that, Jazakallah Khairan, awesome questions, patience. May Allah keep on blessing this masjid, this community, the Muslim Ummah, unite the Muslim Ummah, so we can inshallah fulfill our obligation. Ameen, Jazakallah Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. We have, uh, we have YouTube channels. Uh, we have yislam.org. You can go to their YouTube channel. We have Gain Peace YouTube channel. And I also upload some videos on my channel also. You can Google, not Google, yeah, Google me also or search me on the YouTube with the name Sabil Ahmad, right? So there are so many resources out there. May Allah help us to benefit for them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. ونشهد الله إله إلا أنت ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله